So we are on Exodus chapter 32. Let me read for a little bit. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So, obviously, uh, things are not going well for the children of Israel at this moment. Why, first off, do the... the do the people of Israel kind of uh, go off the deep end here? What is their overt reason? What are they saying the reason is? Moses, Moses is delayed. So in other words, the timing that God has for Moses up on the mountain is not their timing. Now here's your, here's your, um, your trivia question. How long was Moses up on the mountain? 40 days and 40 nights. 40 days and 40 nights. Just like the flood. So he's up there, and admittedly, that is a good while. So, so while he is up there, while he is being delayed, um, the people, and there's a, there's a number of, of phrases in here that are really important. The first here is the people gathered themselves together. Now that sounds like throwaway language, but it is not. This is the exact opposite of God calling and gathering the people together out of the land of Egypt, out of slavery. So now, rather than being called together by God, now they are calling themselves together. They're gathering, they're gathering themselves together. And by the way, there are a lot of interesting parallels between this episode and the Tower of Babel. Okay? So kind of keep that in the back of your back of your mind as we're running through this. So first off, they, they're getting impatient because God's timing is not theirs. I am so glad we don't have that problem. <laughs> what a relief. <laughs> um, so then, they decide to gather themselves together, and they have a request of Aaron. Why do they go to Aaron? He's second in command. He's second in command, exactly. If Moses is gone, Aaron is, the, Aaron is the high priest, and so he is the obvious person who is in charge, insofar as anybody's in charge at this point. So, so they say, up. Oh, <laughs> Make us God. So now they have moved from being, from hearing and receiving God's word from, from his mouthpieces to giving God, giving these representatives from God a mouthpiece. Now they're saying, go do this for us. And this is what you're going to do. You're going to make us gods. Notice that plural there. <laughs> Gods, make for us gods who shall go before us. Now, what does that sound like? That that should that should kind of ring some echoes of other Exodus type stuff that we've had. First commandment: First You shall have no other gods before me. <laughs> so, yeah, we got, definitely have that. Um, we have how had God gone before them? Pillar of cloud and pillar of fire. So God is the one who had gone before them, and now they are saying, we want you to make gods who are going to do what? We're going to go before us. 
So they are quite intentionally replacing what God has done with somebody else or something else, as we'll see. Okay, so, so we get, this is almost, this, this really is textbook first commandment <laughs> right here, is this. And Aaron says, you idiots, what are you thinking? Repent. Not so much. Not so much. Dennis, is this a mob? Is this a, a sort of an interesting question? And, and there is definitely, as we'll see as, as this chapter kind of moves along, that Aaron will very quickly, when Moses comes down, he will very quickly backpedal and basically say, they made me do it. Aaron has flipped Wilson. <coughs> Jared? That, that word up kind of confuses me. Is there a um, it, it just means get moving. Get to work. Basically. Yep. So, um, make gods will go before us. As for Moses, and then, and then there's this really strange phrase where they, they actually remember what had happened. Although notice, they give all of this credit to Moses and not to Yahweh. <laughs> but as for this Moses, whoever this guy is, we don't know who he is, <clears throat> who's been up wandering in the mountain for so long, oh yeah, that guy that delivered us out of the land of Egypt and all this, so we don't know what's happened to him. <sighs> um, I would call that willful ignorance. That is, they know precisely where he is. There's no secrets here. The problem is, isn't that they that that Moses has abandoned them. The problem is that they don't like God's sense of timing. That God's taking too long along the way. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that that is always our temptation. When we are faced with trials or difficulties, we are always tempted by this, well, God is not working on my clock, and he's got to get to work, because obviously I am in charge, <laughs> and since he's late, I'm going to fire him and go hire somebody else that can do what I want. That's the, that's the temptation that we always face when it comes to uh, suffering and trials where the question is, how long, O oh Lord? Rick? How long? Yeah, oh, absolutely. This is Abraham and Isaac. Right, uh, right. I'll come up with a way to do this. Um, I'll, I'll come up with my own way. How many times did God promise to Abraham that he would have a son, etc.? And because the timing was not Abraham's and Sarah's, they were always trying to manipulate the situation so that the situation would fit what they thought God ought to be doing. Funny. So, I mean, they have enough food and everything, it's just the uncertainty. Right? Nobody's starving. Yeah. Nobody's, nobody's dying here. They're, you know, this is, this is still the... They've still got the quail and the manna. And, you know, everything's fine. It's just, they're getting antsy. And they are getting frustrated because things are not happening as they think that they should. Terry. Once again, it's, a, it's obvious that there's it's self will and not God will. Yes, precisely. That is exactly what's going on. So they're looking at their own will, their own desires, their own timing. They're looking at all of these things and saying, we're going to, we're going to gather ourselves together. And we are going to do things as we see fit and not, and not receive from what God has given us. Is everybody with me so far? Okay. So Aaron, Aaron, this is kind of Aaron's, uh, this is his big chance. This is Aaron's slow ball down the middle, right here, where, where they say, we want you to make us other gods. <laughs> he misses completely. And it is as clear as clear can be. So Aaron says, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring
bring them to me. Where did they get all this stuff from? Egyptians. From the Egyptians. That's right, from that plunder from the Egyptians. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made the golden calf. So Aaron takes the gold and, and uses an, uh, an engraver, an Israelite Dremel, he uses an engraver and, and from this fashions this golden calf, probably made of wood that would then be plated with gold. That's most likely. Correct. the same gold that's supposed to be using for the heart. Yeah, that is exactly right. This is the exact gold that that in the chapters, two chapters before, we've had, so you're going to have all these people are now going to willingly give of their own things to build the ark and the, and the lampstand and all of this stuff in the tabernacle, and then they're going to, so now they're taking it, and they're using it for their own purposes, not what God has given to them. I got another part of the question. Follow up. All right. Since it's being used in the name of idolatry, how is it, is that like tarnish the gold that's later used to be used for God's purpose? Oh, you're going to see what happens to the gold here in just a minute. <laughs> so I'll answer that in a minute. See the history of that? The what? <laughs> you know, I did some digging on the, on why a, why a calf. Um, and the, the best answer I could come up with was that like it seems everything else we've found, um, this was a sign of fertility, like everything else. So this is a uh, so this is a common fertility symbol in uh, in ancient cultures, new life, etc. Jerry, I've seen you know, pictures, artists from dreams of the golden calf, and it's not a picture in my mind of of that, and thinking well. Aaron must have melted it all down and then fashioned it, but it doesn't say that. It does not say that. And so it almost looks like not yeah, made out of wood. He just well, that and that it. word, that word, fashion. I mean, that that word it means just for itself. It means shape. So while it could mean um, made from scratch, it would not have to mean that. That's kind of my. I don't think so. If, if there is, it's not here in Exodus. If it's, if it's elsewhere, I, I haven't found it yet. So I don't think so. Calf size? I don't know. Good question. All right. So, so Aaron himself does this fashioning, this engraving work. Now, who is going to do the work for the tabernacle? Do you remember? Three minutes. There were, there were three guys, two, two guys, three guys, there was two guys that were, um, that were actually set apart for the work of, of building the tabernacle. And so not only is Aaron engaging in idolatry, now he is also acting outside of his vocation. See, this is what happens when you have a pastor start to build stuff. Dangerous. They used to be a lesson. <laughs> so, um, so, so he's also acting outside of his vocation. This isn't his job, among other things. Um, so Aaron, however, does it, builds it, and then says, actually, they say, not Aaron, they say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, what did they said like four verses before? Not even four, two verses before. As for this Moses who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to them. So they are spinning this out of their own heads, even though they know that they are that this is not true. And this is kind of this is what idolatry is. Idolatry is creating your own reality. It is creating these things and, and then sort of living in this 
fantasy world and convincing yourself that it's true. And this is this is not just true of golden cows, of course. But but anytime we have our own idolatries, this is always the temptation is to fashion, you know, this kind of misuse of imagination, is to is to fashion all sorts of reality around whatever it is that we have become um, obsessed with along the way. Is everybody with me? Maybe that's just me. <laughs> so the people say, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. So we've got the golden calf, now we have the altar. <clears throat> he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now there are a number of problems with that. What's um, it, under the sort of veneer of it being right? Why does it sound good? Kind of on the surface. Why does it sound good or helpful? Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And, and it's sacrificed to who? To Yahweh. He doesn't say tomorrow we're going to have a feast to the golden calf or to the gods. He says we're going to have a feast to the Lord. So, on, again, on one level, this sounds very much like the sort of thing a high priest would say. Pardon? Sounds like he's just disconnected. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Aaron is living in his own fantasy land here as well. And is trying to and, and is trying to mesh these two together, this idolatry with true worship. And so he's sort of grasping for these things that sound right. But what's wrong with Aaron making this declaration? This, the Lord did not ask for this. Exactly. That Aaron does not get to make this stuff up. This is not just a, you get to decide when these feasts happen. You remember, we've had extremely explicit instructions for the last 10, 12 chapters on how everything is to be built, why they're built this way, when things are supposed to happen, and how all of things. Why? Because God is the one who comes to them. They don't make it up. Do you remember the, our whole conversation about what happens when you make worship into a uh, into sort of a uh, Tower of Babel contest of I'm going to make it mine bigger and greater and better? That's that's what's happening here. So he is create. He is seeking to create his own his own reality here, apart from how God has has delivered it. Now I do have to say one one thing though. And that is, Moses has not come down from the mountain. So what that means is, they haven't heard those ten chapters of instructions yet. Because Moses hasn't come down yet. Alright? So, so there is, and, and that will later be kind of a, a, some wiggle room that Aaron is going to try to use to his own advantage. Rick? I was going to ask about that because lots of things changed. Aaron hasn't been set as high priest yet, right? Right. But he is, but he was clearly he was always the second priest. Right, clearly the second. But he was not the high priest. That's right. That's right. And they've not had the commandments yet. I mean, clearly they've been known that the yeah, all right, but they've I mean, not been given. Yeah. All right. I'm with you. Now, again, though, all of this stuff to this point has been set up prior to, the, to Mount Sinai with God delivering these things to them and God establishing how, how things are to work and why. And so a part of what this episode reveals in a lot of the um, commentaries and stuff that I read of this all kind of make, make hay out of the fact that this was always what had been in the people's hearts. But now that the cat's away, <laughs> the mice are going to the mice are going to play. 
Um, and, and so now this reveals what had always been the temptation that they had, that they had struggled with. Uh, Paul in this area. So, so they didn't write down the temptation. Oh yeah, well we have, for 12 chapters, we have been hearing um, these episodes of the, and you're going to have to remind me of something, because I, I may be wrong on this. Um, no comments from the gallery on that. Um, and that is, we did have the Ten Commandments in chapter 20. In chapter 24, we had the elders going up. Did Moses come down in between before the elders went up so that they had the Ten Commandments but not the rest of the instructions? That's a good question because they went halfway back up with the elders. I don't remember. So, stink of memory. They, they promised. They spoke out. Oh, right, yeah. And, and, that's, and that's kind of why I'm thinking that they, while they haven't gotten all of these instructions, I think that they had some of them because we had the whole, everything that you have said, we will do. You know, they had all of their promises there in chapter 20 after the Ten Commandments. Rick. Two questions. One, what do you say to people who want to know why God waited 2,000 years to write down and give us the Ten Commandments? They were in man's heart from the beginning. Um, why, why, why the special well, deal of writing it is, down? First of all, it is not that God's will... God did not create his will on Mount Sinai, all right? This is where God's will is, is codified, is written down and delivered to the people. But um, the best explanation I've been able to come up with for that, Rick, and Pastor Shaw, if you've got a better one, I'll, I'll happily hear it and then take credit for it. That'd be funny. Um, of course. But uh, is, is that... God wrote the law in man's heart at creation. Uh, with the fall into sin, that law written in man's heart is, is corrupted. And that that corruption continues and, and becomes farther and farther and farther away, more and more corruption, to the point where it is almost completely erased, and that's when we get to that's uh, and, and you get uh, allusions to that in um, in a number of places in Paul's epistle where he'll talk about the, the law being written on their hearts prior to Moses and so Jerry. Um, it seems like the Ten Commandments are, are something that God used to set these people apart. It's the whole world they lived in. And Egypt right. was a really good example. Right. They were brought up with the idea of you've got these gods. That's right. And they were brought up in a culture where you invent your gods. Yep. Yep. And by bringing down the commandments, it seems to me it's setting it's, them it's, apart. It is setting it is setting apart. It is defining for them kind of how all of these things truly truly are. And and again. Kind of making this distinction between God as the creator, the one who orders the universe, who has made all things by his hand and by his word. It is his word that establishes the world and reality. And that and that's what the Ten Commandments are, are speaking of, is saying, this is reality. This is what is best for you. Um, you know, remember that uh, that line. In the Luther hymn, which is which is so interesting that that Moses received them for our good. Do you remember that? It's a really interesting little uh, little little line. Um, you know, when high on Mount Sinai's mind, he stood receiving them for our good. Very interesting little little phrase there that that Luther uses. That these commandments are for our benefit, but. I don't want to give away too much of the sermon for this morning, so I better stop. <laughs> All right. Um, so the people say, these are your gods. Aaron builds an altar, makes a proclamation, and says, tomorrow shall be a feast, a festival to the Lord. And they rose up early the next 
day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. So, and that is definitely language that was common that they had known before. This is, and again, this is uh, taking taking language. This is like um, this is like a Mormon using the Bible, okay, and taking the same Bible, taking the same words, taking the same uh, you know some of the same concepts and twisting them and refashioning them into something completely different, even though they are using words that sound familiar. This is why. Um, this, this is why groups like the Mormons are so um, are, are so sneaky and so difficult for the unprepared Christian to kind of overcome it because you hear this language or Jehovah's Witness, you hear this language and you think they're using all the they're using all the right buzzwords. They got all the right kind of talk. Well, do you believe Jesus is God? Yes, I believe Jesus is a God. Um, you know, and they kind of. And do all of these things so that they're the same words, but it's a completely different dictionary. And then, and then all of a sudden you turn around and realize, wait a minute, this is this is totally different and totally wrong. Well, that's what we have here: is they're doing they're doing the kind of thing that they are going to do in the tabernacle, but because it is not as God gave it to them, it's all wrong. Because they're making it up out of their own heart. And they're trying to do things that they think are going to sound like good God type stuff. Feel one. Like. All right. Any questions? Yeah, Ben. Oh, my question was just that uh, the Israelites already practice not worshiping God as, as a favor thing. Sure. Oh, and right. That was their common practice. Of Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not like they were worshiping the gods of the Egyptians completely and utterly. You remember back in Exodus chapter 1, the whole thing starts with the children of Israel crying out to Yahweh to deliver them. So, um, but I don't know if you know this, people are not always very consistent. <laughs> and so, um, even though they had cried out to Yahweh in their time of need, um, these other things are all kind of happening side by side. They're built in at the same time. And so uh, this sort of language has always been a part of what they have grown up with and around the, the language of idolatry. And so that is a serious temptation for them always. And, you know, when you think of their, uh, their, their sons and daughters, uh, intermarrying with Egyptians, and um, you know, okay, so whose God are we going to worship in our house? You know, all of those sort of questions are all there, and uh, and that's uh, that's what they're struggling with. That's oh yes, on the last line, uh, and the people sat down to eat. Yes. And yeah. dinner. Yes. <laughs> yes. The people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And they're not playing Yahtzee, people. <laughs> um, this is a, a, the word there uh, can mean everything from play to uh, to mock to caress, which would probably give us a little hint of what kind of play they're doing. Um, and and what this is getting at is their uh, that their worship was was there in order to fulfill their own desires. And, uh, and, and now that they have eaten and drunk, and, and all their desires are going to be their own, and they are not going to be pretty. That's kind of, that's what that picture is right there. Is everybody with me? Have I been clear enough on that? <laughs> okay, just check it. All right. Uh, I think we've gotten, we've gotten through all these questions, but, um, yeah, we did all this. All right. And the Lord said to Moses, so we move, the first six verses are down the, down the mountain, now we're back up the mountain. The Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, 
have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. So, the people start with, um, start, with, start with saying to Aaron, get up and get to work for us. And here Yahweh says to Moses, go down the mountain. There's, a, there's definitely a, a linguistic parallel going on there. Um, it's interesting in this, um, in this speech from God, that it is almost as if um, God is separating himself from the people. Did you notice that? Yeah. That, um, that this starts with, for your people, <laughs> you know, he doesn't say my people here, he says your people, for your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, <laughs> have corrupted themselves, which is, which is itself very interesting. Right. This is all self-will. This is the, the idolatry of the self. They have corrupted themselves. They're not, they can't blame it on somebody else. They have corrupted themselves. They have made for themselves a golden calf. And have worship. Remember that, uh, that word worship um, literally means to bow down. That worship is not a um, worship is not simply a mental exercise but is a physical exercise. It is, by the way, one of my very favorite Hebrew words. Surely I told you this word. Kish <laughs> Isn't that a great word? That means to, to bow down in worship. Is that. So they have they are now bowing down to this to this cat. Kind of literally uh, literally uh, the opposite of what they should do. And, and so the contrast between the worship is they are worshiping the calf and they are a stiff-necked people. What does that mean? Stubborn. It literally means they won't bow their head down and worship the true God. I mean, that's, that, so that is, they, that is the contrast of the word worship is so they are bowing down to the calf, and they refuse to bow down to me, to the true God. So that's what it means to be stiff-necked, is, is stubborn, immovable, un unwilling to repent or to recognize when they've done something wrong. All that's kind of behind that. <clears throat> so, so what does God tell Moses to do? He says, go down, then what? And, you know, these people are, are bad, blah, blah. So, so then what does he tell God, to tell Moses to do? Verse 10. Leave me alone. Here we get a little hint at the role that Moses plays as, as the Christ figure. As the mediator. Okay? So, so this is clearly God speaking uh, in the law is that you know, the day you the day you eat of it, you will surely die. <laughs> this is definitely God speaking in the law and saying, Moses, I want you to stand out of the way so that I can now purify these people by by consuming them in their sin. That's what, that's what God is saying. So it's very clearly law. They very clearly deserved this as well. This is their own desire. And so, so God is kind of thinking, okay, if you want to live apart from me, let's see how that works out for you. I am going to take my blessing away. 
I am going to pull back my blessing from you. you know? And when the Lord of life pulls back his blessing, what does that leave? Death. <laughs> that's all that's left. So that's, so that's what he's saying here. And then with this sort of promise to Moses of that I may consume them so that I may make a great nation of you. I, and, uh, and I struggle with that phrase a little bit personally. Um, but remember, Moses is not, what tribe is Moses from? Remember? Levi. He's not from the tribe of Judah. So Moses is not one of Jesus' ancestors. So, so that's kind of, kind of a big deal on this whole thing. Can I go on? Yeah, part. How does that apply today? Like, you know, we hear pastors come out with some uh, bad happens, like a tsunami or a you bet. saying, you know, this is what happens, that you just want to live in your sin, and usually it's a big uproar. Sure. Because they say, well, God, you know, is coming down on you. Yes, and that's right, and that's the judgment. And of course, we. Who, who was the TV preacher that got into all kinds of hot water over? Pat Robertson. Yes. Was was. Oh, yeah. know you know about the TV previews. <laughs> um, yeah, Pat Robertson after after Katrina saying that this was this was God's judgment upon the city of New Orleans because it was such an openly evil city, and everybody piles on Pat Robertson um, for for saying such a mean thing. Now. Of course, he's both wrong and right. <laughs> he's wrong in the sense that that, um, it, that it's different than any other disaster. Right. The wages of sin is death, and so anytime there's death, this is always a sign of God's judgment. And, and the, the trick that we always play is that we want to pick the judgments to make sure that the judgments aren't on me. <laughs> Nobody wants to say, well, you know, I was in Katrina, and, and when all that happened, that was obviously God's judgment upon me. No, I want to be here where it's nice and safe, and look at those poor saps that are getting judged over there. <laughs> that, that's always our desire. And so, and so when we're looking at judgment, the wages of sin is death. And anytime there is death and destruction, that is the result of sin. What we can't do is make nice little one-to-one -one comparisons. You know, because there was this kind of sin in this city, this is the kind of death that God brought upon it. Why can't we do that? <clears throat> Why can't we do it? <clears throat> because God's word doesn't say that. <laughs> God's word does not say, if you do this sin, this is the kind of death you're going to have. Not in a nice kind of thing. Now, we can make all sorts of inferences and we can make any kind of wild speculation that we want. But ultimately, how that judgment is given out is in God's hands, not ours. For which I personally am very thankful. Um, so that's kind of what we see is this, uh, is this judgment here. Verse 11. But, oh, sorry. Yes. It's so hard to well, this disease came because of this. Well, sure. And you, know, you bet. Hard to and, the, uh, and the perfect, and, and of course, the textbook example of that is AIDS. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, so, it's so, 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 so easy to say, well, AIDS obviously came about because of all of the, because of um, <laughs> uh, all of this sinful, sinful sexual behavior, period. And, you know, well, what does that mean for someone that, that gets AIDS from a blood transfusion or, you know, whatever? It, but I don't want to think about those because it's much nicer if I can just sort of make sweeping judgments and write off a whole bunch of people, which we can't do. And even if it were true, it wouldn't matter <laughs> because these are still people whom Christ has died for. And of course they're sinners, so are we. <laughs> so even if it were true, it would be irrelevant because God still died, died for them. Anyway, that's a whole other sermon. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, 
O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? So notice what Moses does here. He takes himself out of the picture and says, look, these are your people, God. Don't, you know, you're not getting off the hook here. These are your people. This is your problem. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent, did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. The Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. So what's Moses' tactic here in interceding with God? What's his, kind of, what's his approach here? Asking him to remember his promises. Yep, yep. God loves for us to use his word against him. Remember all that stuff that you promised <laughs> over and over and over again? Do you remember when you said those words? This is, this is the Psalms right here. This is, this is every time we say, through Jesus Christ our Lord, we're saying, Oh God, remember what you have promised. Keep your promises which you have made to your people. Through Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ. So, that, so this is Moses as the mediator, as the go-between, as the intercessor between God and the people. And this is why Jesus is called the greater Moses. Right here. As Moses is not, is not um, pictured here as the lawgiver, but as the person for whom the people owe their lives. Because he <coughs> reminds God of God's promises. Now there is a, a question that you should be asking yourself at this point. What's the question? Why does God need to be reminded of his own promises? And, pardon? Oh, to show Moses' faithfulness to it. Nope. Nope. Jerry? I think I'll put the wrong answer. I'm sure you did. <laughs> you were probably right. My question was, were those promises conditional? And the answer to that is no. That's God. Um, Moses does not remind God of his promises in the Ten Commandments, but in the promise given to Abraham, which is a one-way promise. Well, we will start with the answer to that question next week. All right. And on that note, let's close this benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Have a great week.